Hi everyone, a very warm well welcome to an part six human wildlife encounters webinar. Thank you all for joining us on both Zoom and on YouTube. My name is Chanel and I'll be your host for this morning. Our efforts to enhance our natural spaces have brought people closer to nature and wildlife. This is the sixth session of a series of webinars where we'll be covering the different wildlife species commonly encountered and the science-based approach in understanding both the ecology and distribution as we promote responsible and positive human wildlife coexistence. So today's webinar is will be on reptiles. Okay. We'll be joined by members of the Reptile Working Group, which consists of Kanan Raja, and Sankar Ananta Narayanan from the Herpetological Society of Singapore, Dr. Abraham Matthew and Dr. Shalene Yong from Wildlife Reserve Singapore, and our colleagues from Parks Wildlife Management, Ms. Serena Lin, Mr. Nicholas Chuan, and Dr. Benjamin Lee. All our panelists are actively involved in the conservation of reptiles in Singapore. So together, the speakers will share more about reptiles, their biology, ethology, distribution, rescue, and monitoring. And finally, answer all your queries on what to do when we encounter them in our city in nature. So after the sharing, we will be having an interactive Q&A session. If you have any questions along the way, do send them to Serena as a private message using the Zoom chat and we will try to answer as many questions as we can. Now, I hope you are as excited to hear from our speakers as I am. I'll hand the time over to our very first speaker, Kanan, who is the Scientific Officer of the Herpetological Society of Singapore. So Kanan, please take it away. Hello, everyone. Good morning. And uh, I see so many people here. So uh, I'll be talking about some of the commonly seen reptiles in Singapore. Uh, you may have seen some of them regularly. Uh, so yeah, let's go. So uh, yeah, these are some of the reptiles uh, you can find in Singapore. Some of them are native to our island. Some of them are not. Uh, but how many reptiles are really there? Right. Uh, next slide, please. So we have 67 species of snakes, 37 species of lizards, 16 species of turtles, tortoises, and terrapins, and one species of crocodile. And uh, out of all of them, it's usually the snakes and lizards that we see very commonly in our nature spaces. Uh, so let's look at some of them now. Okay, so uh, this is like a huge spectrum thing, right? We're going to look at the biggest and the smallest uh, urban reptiles as well. So. Uh, Radicular pythons, very commonly found in Singapore. And uh, there's always a misconception. People always think the snake is going to get very big you know, and they always uh, think, uh, base it on like anaconda movie and stuff like that. But the thing is the pythons in Singapore do not get as big as movie animals, maybe about four meters. And uh, they are found across the islands and they do a great service to all of us by eating rodents. In fact, uh, it was found in two different studies. I think one by... Uh, and Devon Song and anything at other by Sanka that uh, pythons diets in Singapore, uh, uh, rats make up almost 70% of the diets of pythons in Singapore. And because of this, we have the pythons to thank for, for keeping our rat populations down. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have the Brahmini blind snake, which people often assume that it's like an herbworm or any other kind of worm. But uh, I'm not sure whether you can see it clearly on this picture, but if you kind of like zoom in or get close to your screen, you can actually see it has got tiny scales on its body. So it's a very tiny snake, but it's also commonly found in many places around Singapore. Next slide, please. Uh, and then next we come to the snake. So these are usually called garden snakes. <clears throat> it's a, a commonly used term for them. Uh, over here we have two of them, the paradise tree snake and the common house snake. Uh, these both are quite vividly marked snakes and uh, they are found around landed properties and gardens and parks. And um, you can see for the wolf snake, right, it's kind of like a chocolatey brown color with like white speckles and a pale color. And the paradise tree snake is kind of uh, a bluish greenish with a black top and a pale yellow bottom. And uh, these guys are not harmful to humans. 
although the uh, Paradise Peace Snake does have some mild venom, but it's largely used for uh, subduing its prey. Uh, both of them are great for eating up lizards and geckos, and sometimes when they are on the forage for food or when they are chasing a lizard, they may accidentally end up inside your homes. And um, like, but, but they are not there to harm you or anything, they're just kind of like looking for a meal and they got lost. So yeah, uh, next one please. Uh, another commonly encountered snake, and this is sometimes can be quite difficult to see, is the uh, oriental whip snake. Uh, they are usually very brightly green and thin snakes. Uh, these are snakes usually used in memes on the internet when they call them judgmental shoelings. Uh, you can see why from the pictures. And uh, yeah, they, they, are, uh, they, they are also lizard eaters and sometimes they do take birds and stuff. Uh, they do have a mild venom, uh, also used for subduing prey and stuff, so they are not harmful to humans. Uh, but with any animal, you should always keep a safe distance and do not uh, bother the animals because they can get defensive. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, another group of snakes commonly encountered will be the bronze specks. We have six different bronze specks species in Singapore. Uh, I've only pictured five of them here. I could not find a picture for the last one, the striped bronze speck. And out of these uh, six species, uh, the striped bronze speck and the uh, painted bronze speck are the ones which are commonly in uh, parks and gardens. And uh, the rest of them are more forest species. And these are non venomous snakes, and they're quite jumpy. And they're quite skittish. So if you were to see one and you were to approach it, it would kind of try to get, get out of there, away from you. Uh, next slide, please. But then again, we also encounter venomous species or, on a regular basis around Singapore. And the most common example is equatorial or black spitting cobra. Uh, as the name suggests, they are spitting cobras and they are black. Uh, they have little to no obvious markings, although some of them do have like a pale uh, throat marking, as you can see in the image over there. Uh, spitting venom is a self-defense and uh, they usually will try to go for your eyes. So you should always uh, keep a safe distance. Should you see one, always feel free to take pictures, but take it from a safe distance. And uh, it does come with the one, they make a very loud hissing sound if you do get too close. Uh, so you would end up finding them. Uh, and these guys, they're always looking on the, out, on the look for toads, frogs, and sometimes the rats. And uh, I've personally seen some in uh, neighborhood parks myself. So yeah, quite adaptable animals and uh, they're not too worried about being in a distant habitat with a lot of human movement as well. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, this is something else we always get. People, uh, especially on a nature walk or people on, on the internet, they'll be like, oh, I saw a Komodo dragon in Singapore. Uh, many of you may have come across this as well. Uh, fortunately, or unfortunately, we do not have wild Komodo dragons in Singapore. Uh, what we have are they are smaller cousins, the monitor lizards. Uh, we have three monitor lizards in Singapore, monitor lizard species in Singapore, the Malayan water monitor, the clouded monitor, and the dumerils monitor. And out of these three, the dumerils is uh, quite a rare and uh, shy species that's only found in like uh, deep inside the forest and it's not usually seen uh, at all. Uh, the other two, however, they are common urban reptiles and they're usually found wherever you can find water. So if you've got like a neighborhood park or like a pond nearby, uh, they, may, they may visit for food. And um, they're also skittish animals and they're usually the first line to get is to get away from people when you approach them. Uh, they do get quite big, so they can be quite intimidating for some people when you're um, in this uh, And monitors also do a decent service to the environment and us by being scavenged. Uh, they always look out for decay or dead animal matter and they'll eat it and they help keep the nature areas clean. Uh, yeah, uh, next one, please. Oh, yeah, and also if you do think you've seen a Komodo uh, probably standing in front of the Komodo enclosure at the zoo. And if it's not inside the zoo and you think it's a Komodo dragon, you should probably let someone know. So, yeah, this is a PSA. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, strangers from afar. So uh, the reptiles I've covered so far are native to Singapore. Uh, however, we have some non-native reptiles we have, which have made their home here and they're very comfortable and they're very, very urbanized. Uh, you may have seen probably the changeable lizard and the red sliders very commonly. The brown anole is kind of spreading around the island now, and so is the green iguana. So where did these animals come from? They're not from here. So uh, 
they usually are here from accidental or deliberate uh, introductions. Uh, deliberate introduction is obviously the illegal pet trade, where uh, these animals are illegally brought into Singapore and sold to people, and then they end up escaping or people end up abandoning them due to their size or due to difficulty of care. Or sometimes they are legal pets, like the red-eared slider, but then they get dumped. You know, at some point, uh, a pet owner realizes that, oh, I can't take care of this animal anymore, and then just drop it off at the nearest nature reserve or pond, and these animals grow. The thing with uh, non-native species like these, is that they are tough competitors to our native reptiles and they can chase away our, tough, our native reptiles from the habitats. Like the changeable lizard has pretty much uh, moved our native green crested lizard away from gardens and parks by being larger and more aggressive. And, uh, and since they do not have natural predators, uh, they grow pretty quickly and they become like a dominant species uh, in many uh, parts of the world. Uh, they are not uh, in, they are not, invasive only to Singapore, but to other parts of the world as well. So yeah, it's quite unfortunate that there's the illegal pet trade going on and that it plays a negative impact in more ways than one, especially on our native biodiversity. Uh, I think that's all for me from now. Uh, next, I'd like to pass over to Dr. Abraham. We'll be talking about rescuing reptiles from urban areas. Uh, Dr. Abraham, please. Thank you, uh, Kanan. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, as Kanan has mentioned, uh, there are a lot of uh, commonly seen reptiles in Singapore. And uh, I, for one, find this absolutely fascinating. Um, of course, uh, those of us in, in sitting here giving this, talking to you guys, uh, we, we love reptiles and, and we just find it absolutely amazing that you can see this in the city. And, uh, you know, it's, it's like watching National Geographic Wild uh, right there at your doorstep, uh, you know, without having to travel miles and miles or deep into a jungle. Uh, you don't have to go anywhere. You can actually just look outside your window sometimes and you can see them. And, and this is just such a blessing. And I think we're so fortunate to have this. Uh, I mean, where else in a city you get to see a king cobra or a reticulated python, or you take a walk down to Sungai Bulo and you can see wild crocodiles. I mean, this is just fantastic. Um, unfortunately, uh, yes, there is an unfortunate uh, uh, circumstance here. Um, sometimes these uh, reptiles are not so welcome and uh, they're not so welcome by us, by people, uh, uh, not so much by their own kind. And, and therefore it creates a conflict. Now this conflict is actually uh, between, uh, is what we go through and what we feel. Um, the reptiles are actually not in conflict unless they are provoked at that time. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, a lot of the species that, that come out to areas which we deem they shouldn't be in, uh, uh, they are then rescued. Uh, you look at the photograph uh, here, that's a picture of a king cobra uh, eating a, or, or trying to uh, uh, subdue a python, and then he's going to have that as a meal. I mean, this is just phenomenal. This is on the road. This was in front of NTU a couple of years ago. Where else can you see things like this? But when something like this happens, uh, people generally get apprehensive because of our, you know, our uncertainty of reptiles, or or we we are we are a little bit afraid. We 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 feel that hey, look, you know, uh, they shouldn't be here. But for the reptile, they have taken Singapore as part of their ecos ecosystem, and and they they have adapted so well that they don't even mind. Uh, uh, consuming an animal uh, in the middle of the open space on the road because that's how they've adapted. And, and this just tells you how amazing these animals actually are. So we should appreciate them for, for what they can actually uh, uh, bring uh, to the table. Yeah. Next slide, please. So what happens when uh, they are uh, deemed in conflict? Uh, we, have, we, we, we go out there and we actually rescue them. Uh, from these areas, right? Uh, and the rescues are usually done by national parks and acres. And uh, once these animals are rescued, uh, they are brought to us at WRS. Um, and so what do we do there? Uh, so the species that are brought to us are, are you know, all kinds, uh, but in, for, for reptiles, it's, it's mainly snakes, uh, soft shell turtles, uh, monitor lizards. We get the occasional crocodile once in a while. Um, and for snakes, it's a reticulate 
reticulated pythons uh, predominantly, as uh, Kanan mentioned earlier, uh, you know, they are found throughout the island. Uh, so when they are sent to us, we actually assess them to make sure uh, they are okay. Now, animals that are in good or acceptable conditions, uh, we actually place a microchip in them, and then uh, these animals are then released by national parks and acres uh, in the designated uh, nature reserves. Uh, this microchip is like an ID. Uh, it gives the animal uh, an identification. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's like your ID card, or for those of you who have uh, domestic uh, pets, uh, you know, some of, some of your animals have got a microchip inserted uh, uh, into your animal. Um, and this is basically uh, for us to have data on these animals. Um, animals that are in poor condition, uh, some of them come to us in, in you know, they're really skinny, they're emaciated, uh, they've been badly injured by whatever reason, sometimes from the capture process, uh, sometimes uh, for other, other kinds of accidents. Uh, animals like this are then euthanized on humane grounds. Now, if you look at the photographs uh, on the left, uh, bottom left, uh, that's Dr. Charlene, my colleague, and, and our staff, uh, uh, Siyun, our, our ward staff at the hospital. Uh, they are examining a snake that has been brought to us. These snakes that are rescued are usually placed in a bag. And, and these bags are, you know, they're breathable bags, they're comfortable bags. And, and snakes are actually very comfortable uh, in bags because it's like, a, it's like a security blanket for them. So they're brought in this way and then uh, we, we will assess them. Uh, we, we check them through the bag and uh, uh, we can tell whether they're, they're in good body, body condition, we can tell whether they have sustained injuries and things like that. And of course, we also get this information from and Parks and Acres on, on the history of what had happened with the snake. Uh, if you look at the middle pictures, uh, uh, that's how we insert the microchip uh, uh, into the animal. Uh, and the chip is actually placed under the skin. And then the bottom picture is, is how we use the reader, the microchip reader, to then uh, read the chip uh, through the skin. And, and then we get an ID. Uh, the bottom right photo is just an example of how we actually weigh the snake. So the snake is in the bag, and then we place the whole bag on the weighing scale uh, uh, and then we get the uh, weight of the snake. This is this is some of the work that we do once the animal is rescued. Um, next slide, please. Um, so then a, a lot of these uh, uh, animals that are then rescued, right? They give us a lot of clues on how they actually cope and have adapted within Singapore's ever-changing landscape. Um, we, we don't uh, waste these opportunities when we get them uh, and we get our hands on them. We, we use the opportunities to, to collect a lot of data, uh, example, body measurements, weights, ultrasound images, uh, radiographic images, things like that. Uh, we take uh, uh, samples from them, blood samples. Uh, we, we look for parasites. Uh, we check their fecal matter to find out what they eat and what they might harbor and things like that. And all this information allows us to understand the, their biology a lot better. One of the examples I can give you, which I find fascinating on how reticulated pythons, for example, have adapted to living in Singapore. Um, as Kanan mentioned, they are actually the, the, the longest uh, snakes in the world. They, 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 they actually have a reputation of growing up to 10 meters long. But in Singapore, you know, the really big ones may reach four meters, uh, three, three meters, three and a half are your average sizes. And about 20 years ago, you can find five, six meter specimens uh, fairly readily. But over the years, they have adapted to living in the city. And this is what I find fascinating about them. And they, and they have adapted to eating to rats, which are small size prey, that they they, they grow accordingly. So they don't become overly large because they don't have large prey base in Singapore. So they've learned how to adapt uh, in surviving uh, within the city. And I find this fascinating. Uh, and these are the things, you know, collecting all this data has helped us understand things like this. Uh, the different kinds, we've done a number of research uh, uh, work on, on uh, various uh, groups of reptiles. Um, uh, and examples of this is uh, understanding what the python eats in Singapore. And Kanan mentioned earlier that we have found out that 
70% uh, of the diet consists of rats. Uh, and we also understand their movement patterns. You know, we've placed uh, radio telemetry devices on them to see how they move around Singapore. Um, and isn't it fantastic to find out that pythons actually uh, do their uh, social uh, uh, obligations by controlling uh, pests such as rats in Singapore? It, it's just phenomenal uh, how these animals contribute to our ecosystem. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I, I would like to emphasize this to, to all of you um, because we see a lot of this. Uh, uh, try and leave the rescues to the trained personnel. Uh, uh, various reasons, right? For human safety, uh, firstly, uh, reptiles can be potentially uh, very dangerous. Um, so, you know, our safety is very important and we have to think of that. Animal welfare, reptiles feel pain too. Uh, uh, you know, contrary to what a lot of people think because of their appearance, you know, they may look all uh, nasty or some may even say they, they look very evil and things like that. Uh, uh, but but they, they do feel pain. Their, their nervous system is very similar to ours. Uh, so just like how you feel pain, uh, they feel pain as well. And then, of course, we have got very uh, uh, strict uh, wildlife acts um, to protect them. So if uh, they are injured, uh, that's actually uh, an act of cruelty on them. So we have to be mindful of things like this. If you look at the skull of that uh, snake uh, on the top, um, you will notice that the snakes actually have very sharp teeth uh, and it's all pointed backwards. It's, it's like a fishing hook. So if it grips onto you, it can, one, it's painful because the teeth are sharp, Two, uh, that grip is, is a very, very strong grip. And if you try to pull your, your limb away, your hand away, it can actually tear your skin and things like that. So that's why it can inflict quite a bit of injury on you. So, so trained personnel know exactly what to do. Next slide, please. So these are just examples of um, uh, uh, what injuries that they can cause. Uh, sorry, uh, Chanel, if you could go back to the previous slide. Uh, sorry. Yeah, if you look at the bottom pictures, you will see how uh, this snake is, is, by the way, this snake was euthanized because of the extensive uh, injury the snake uh, 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 went through. If you look at the photograph, uh, you will see some form of bruising on that head. You can see a bit of discoloration in the mouth. And then if you look at the bottom right picture, uh, you will see a tear in the skin. Now, all this don't look that severe. Uh, next slide, please, Shannon. This is the same snake on the left. If you look at the top part of the head, yes, you do see the bruising, but you do not realize the extent of the bruising. And when our pathologists actually then do a post-mortem on the snake, you will realize how the bruising is actually quite extensive. Now, uh, this, this is what happens to a lot of them. Uh, outwardly, they may not look like they have been injured, so we think it's okay, but on the inside, they go through a lot of bruising and bleeding, and this eventually kills them. Yeah. Next slide, please. This is a, a picture of a common uh, house snake or the wolf snake. If you look at the pictures on the left, that's the top side and the bottom side of the snake. And if you look at, look at it from the outer skin, everything looks normal. Uh, but if once a necropsy is done or a postmortem is done on the right, you can see that there is bruising on the top of the head. And if you look at the bruising internally of this snake, there's quite a bit of bleeding that is going on inside. Uh, this was a snake that was also uh, rescued uh, by personnel who don't know how to handle them. And, and they inflicted quite a bit of injury on the snake that the snake actually died. Yeah, so we have to be very careful about this. Next slide, please. This is an example of a soft shell turtle that was brought to us. And it had, uh, uh, this is a, a radiograph of that soft shell turtle. And if you can, if you look carefully, uh, there's a fishing hook uh, inside the esophagus of this uh, soft shell turtle. Uh, this, this, you know, this stems from, you know, you have, uh, people that, that conduct irresponsible fishing in areas they're not supposed to fish or, or using methods that they're not supposed to use and things like that. 
it inflicts a lot of injury to, to the reptiles outside. So please be mindful about things like this. Uh, these are not easy to, 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 uh, to treat. Uh, removing a fishing hook is not an easy task. It's quite an elaborate task. And sometimes we can't actually do it. Sometimes we can, yeah. Next slide, please. Um, so these are some of the reptile attributes and instincts, right? And, and the reason why we leave the uh, rescues to the, to the trained personnel. The reptiles have tough skin, uh, which are scales. And the idea of this is to protect themselves from natural predators and prey. And their natural predators and prey um, are, are usually not humans, yeah? Their predators are not humans and their natural prey is not humans. Uh, so don't worry about, oh, there's a snake, it, it, it might come in to actually attack us. No, it's not going to do that. The first defense of the snake is actually to stay quiet uh, or to flee. And uh, the only time they actually get offensive is to eat, uh, which is their normal prey, or when they feel threatened, uh, uh, usually by humans or by predators. Uh, they're very instinctive. Uh, they read body language. I, I, I would love to share this with you. You know, uh, Dr. Charlene and me, uh, we, we, we have the, the wonderful experience of working with a barrage of species, uh, you know, and, and wildlife. And, and it's fascinating. But the thing that drew me to reptiles was the very fact that because they're instinctive and they read body language, reptiles are actually the only wildlife that I know that I work with that will not attack you unnecessarily. So if you know how to work with a reptile and you know how to handle them gently, uh, they actually don't bite you. They don't attack you. You can, you, can, you can work with them comfortably. You can never do this with a mammal. You can never do this with a bird. Man, they will go for you. You know, you try holding a little, a, a tiny little squirrel in your hand and this thing is going to bite you, but not a reptile. And, and that's what I really admire about them. And that's what drew me to them. I find this fascinating. So, you know, it, a lot of people think, oh, reptiles are horrible creatures. Actually, they, they are amongst the best. They, they, they are the ones who will leave you alone and, and they are the ones that are extremely gentle with you, right? Uh, they do not attack unless provoked and they always give you a warning first. Kanan mentioned earlier that, you know, the, the spitting cobra, they will give you a loud hiss. Uh, that, that is a warning and many other reptiles will give you a warning uh, and, and therefore, you know, so you know, okay, I, I, I should stay away. Look, the, the animal is not too happy now and, and things like that, you know. So the, the attributes of trained personnel, um, they are trained to read the reptile's body language and warning. So when you know this, you will know how to work with them quite, quite well. Uh, they understand reptile's instincts uh, very well. Um, they are trained and certified in handling reptiles correctly. Uh, NPARCS has got a very elaborate uh, program that uh, actually train uh, certain groups of, of people uh, from, from different areas to be able to manage uh, uh, animals that are, uh, are in conflict in Singapore. So we actually have good programs that are underway and, 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 and good people to manage these issues. Uh, they are also trained to, in using appropriate tools to handle the reptile without causing injury. Can I have the next slide, please? If you look at this tool on the right, this is the trouble today with uh, the social media and the internet and television programs. They make it look like everybody can do things like this. Uh, I'm here to tell you that not everybody can do this. Uh, if you've gone through proper training and whatnot, yes, uh, you will have a, a better understanding of how to go about it. Uh, but the whole idea of, of training is also to train you with what are good tools. This tool on the bottom uh, right is an example of a tool that is sold on the internet to tell you that you can use this for reptiles. Uh, next uh, picture, please. You know. Please don't ever use this. If you looked at those tools, those are known as snake tongs and it's serrated. If you use that tool on a snake or any reptile, you are going to injure them badly. So there's a lot of uh, mis- uh, 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 misunderstandings uh, out there on the species. And, and there's a lot of wrong uh, tools out there for these various species. So please leave it to the trained personnel and uh, just enjoy the reptiles in, in the city 
and you know uh, count it uh, as, 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 as a luxury to have this amongst uh, uh, us uh, within within our within our city. Uh, with that, uh, I will now pass the time to uh, Mr. Nicholas uh, uh, from from NPARCS to to take you to the next uh, topic. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Abraham. I uh, appreciate uh, the partnership that we have. Uh, yeah, so yeah, my name is Nicholas. I work in uh, NPARCS and our team at our wildlife management and outreach branch uh, look particularly at these what we call human wildlife encounters. And yeah, so we uh, often a lot of residents, a lot of Singaporeans ask us why reptiles are found in urban areas. And uh, mainly it's due to two big buckets of reasons. The first is the availability of food. For these reptiles, it will be these prey species like uh, what uh, Dr. Abraham and Kanan mentioned about rats uh, and other things like amphibians, lizards, birds, and invertebrates as well. Uh, another reason as well is uh, shelter that might they might find in urban areas. Uh, these could be burrows in the ground, uh, some unused pots and containers or tree cavities because they like to get into these uh, small and dark areas to cool off after you know being in the sun for a while. So these are two main reasons. Next slide. So yeah, I'm going to talk about what we do when we encounter uh, reptiles uh, in public areas and then at home. So in public areas, say you're uh, walking in a park and you realize that you've, you've seen a reptile, uh, what you do generally as what uh, Dr. Abraham mentioned, just stay calm and back away slowly. Uh, they're very shy. They wouldn't attack you. Just give them the space to retreat and go back into their own habitat. And that's uh, good. So uh, do not approach or attempt to handle the snake. Uh, leave it as it is, especially if it's uh, in its natural habitat, like in a grassy area. Uh, if you do need assistance, uh, for example, if it is you know, stuck in a certain, uh, you know, if it's stuck somewhere or uh, you know, it requires a little bit of handling that it, it, it's just stuck somewhere, you can call us at our 24-7 uh, animal, animal Response Center helpline, 1-800-476-1600 if you need assistance. Uh, if you are walking uh, your dogs or other pets, uh, you know, keep them close to you uh, for dogs on a tight leash as they might chase the snake as they may uh, start getting in a conflict situation. Uh, lastly, if you do, uh, on a very uh, small chance, get bitten by a snake, do seek medical assistance immediately. Uh, don't try to do all sorts of other things like sucking the blood out, uh, sucking the blood out and everything. Like you see in the movies, that doesn't, that's not good. Just seek uh, medical assistance immediately. Next slide, please. All right, so yeah, this is just some examples of uh, pythons that you can see in our monsoon canals. We also often uh, receive calls about crocodiles in our canals. Actually, those are uh, monitor lizards that have been uh, misidentified. Yeah, so do not worry when you see them there. Just, you know, they're, this is pretty common. They use these to travel uh, in our urban areas, so you can just uh, leave them be. Right, so uh, going back home, what do you do when you encounter a snake at home? Right, so this may be a little more of a, a difficult situation for you because this is in a more comfortable uh, environment for you and you don't want the animals coming in. So yeah, just keep a distance again, right? And uh, if you require a call for professional help, call that, that number I gave earlier, the 1-800 number. Uh, the snake may will be able to uh, leave more for the most part. Make sure that you keep away, you know, especially your young children and pets that may be curious and want to go closer to it. Uh, just uh, make sure they, are, they stay away. Uh, if they are found in a room, you allow the snake to exit through the doors by leaving them open. Uh, and then after that whole situation, maybe you want to do some uh, you know, investigation on why the snake will have come to your area. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it could be due to uh, the presence of food uh, or maybe even some small cavities. Uh, next slide. Right, so these are some tips you can use to prevent uh, snakes from entering your home. So uh, exercise proper waste management, right? Because if you have food left out, uh, snakes may be attracted here. Uh, removes any hiding places that uh, snakes may rest in. So any unused pots or containers, uh, yeah, just remove them. Any holes or gaps in your property that they may use to enter or even hide in there, uh, seal them off. Uh, if, you, if you realize you continue um, having snakes uh, enter your home, you can install wire mesh or acrylic paints that are about one meter in height and dug into the ground. This prevents any ground dwelling snakes from entering in and seal up uh, any cracks in the walls. If you have a garden, uh, keep a grass short so they don't hide in there and also fill up any holes or burrows they may use to hide and uh, even lay eggs. If you have a pet at home, ensure that it's in a cage uh, that is snake proof or indoors. This is pretty much the same for monitor lizards as well. Uh, the only other thing I would add 
is uh, yeah, if I've uh, encountered certain uh, properties with a, a, a pool, a swimming pool, and then they have a deck nearby, and then that deck has a gap underneath, that's another important place to seal off because uh, we've realized that these species like to go under there and cool off as well. Uh, yeah, if you do have a water source, like a fish pond as well, you can install a wire mesh or fence around it to prevent the monitor lizards from accessing it and wanting to you know, eat the, the fish inside, which they see as prey. All right, finally, just wanted to wrap up uh, my part of the presentation, just talking very briefly about how uh, NPARCS regulates and develops the wildlife management industry. So as uh, Dr. Abraham mentioned, we have uh, these causes that we uh, hold to teach uh, the participants how you handle uh, the animals uh, in a manner that is uh, you know, safe for uh, the personnel, for the public around, and also that uh, it ensures that the animal welfare is uh, protected. Right, so uh, we have three causes in our uh, from 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 the wildlife side. We have the basic module that teaches on birds, as you can see below. Uh, in the middle column, which is what's relevant for today's webinar, is on reptiles. So you see on the bottom picture, uh, some participants. Uh, we work with the zoo for this. Uh, we uh, teach them how to handle um, pythons at the zoo, and then finally. Uh, the mammals elective module as well, where we teach uh, how to handle especially small mammals. Uh, we also have a public registry of certified animal management, animal management specialists, excuse me, uh, that's hosted on our NPARCS website. You can see our 150 uh, individuals who have been registered uh, and certified, and you can contact them if you require any assistance that you may need. All right now, now hand the time back to Kanan to talk about uh, reptiles and roadkill. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, hello again, everyone. Uh, so uh, this is one of the uh, projects or studies that the HSS, the Project Study of Singapore, has been working on now. So uh, roads are one of the largest source of like mortality for animals, uh, especially uh, for vertebrates, in fact, and not just reptiles. So uh, let's take a quick look at this map, right? Uh, this is from, I think, the last six months up to the 1st of September. And uh, you can see we've got 66 snakes, 21 lizards, uh, one turtle, and 18 amphibians. Uh, the amphibians is a pain because we're not focusing on them for this talk. Uh, so you, you can see kind of like the general spread of uh, reptile roadkills uh, around the island. Uh, by the way, the QR code there is so you can scan it and you can find out what the, uh, the Google form looks like. So we have a Google form. It's about a, a public science project. Uh, so you can... Uh, submit roadkill records uh, to it. If you see them with pictures and locations and stuff. Uh, I think Sankar has also dropped a link as well. If you want to click and check it out as well, if you do not want to scan the QR code. Right, so uh, next slide please, Chanel. So uh, you might think, oh, do we have that many uh, roadkill chances in Singapore? We actually do. Uh, I think this data is from sometime in 2018 slash 2019. Uh, so we've got about just under 10,000 kilometers of paved roads, 30 kilometers of mountain biking trails, and more than 300 kilometers of park connectors, and uh, just under a million vehicles. So now we may have hit a million vehicles since this data is about three years old. So with this many roads and this many vehicles, we have a lot of chance of potential road kills. Uh, but you might wonder, uh, wait, but why are we talking about mountain bike trails and park connectors and road kills, right? I'll show you why. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, when we look at roadkill, it's not just roadkill. We're looking at wildlife vehicle collisions. Uh, this can be on a non-road uh, location with non-motorized vehicles. So mountain bikes, e-scooters, even PMDs uh, can contribute to roadkill, uh, wildlife vehicle collisions. And uh, this can happen anywhere, right? Your park connectors, your mountain biking trails, off-road cycling trails, pavements. Yeah, you know, pavements are walking pavements. Someone just rides a bicycle across, they could kill or injure a reptile. And we also want to look at reptiles that are not uh, dead, those that are injured and uh, still alive. Uh, for these ones, we always urge members of public to contact NPARCS or ACRES first uh, so that the animal can get some help and uh, maybe it can be on the path uh, to healing. Uh, next uh, slide, please. So what can you do as a uh, member of public? If you do come across a wildlife uh, vehicle collision victim, which is either dead or dying, you can snap it. You can send it to our uh, slides. That's a QR code again, and we will share it. Uh, why would we want to share it? By sharing it, we can do a few things, uh, which I'm talking about in the next slide. So uh, when you share it, right, uh, we can raise awareness to people. 
So people will know that, oh, this place has got uh, a high amount of reptiles or animals and they'll take measures to slow down. Uh, maybe uh, we can put up signs like this uh, at hotspots uh, so that people uh, do not speed over there and hit the reptiles, you know? And uh, what you can do in addition to sharing all these things is you can also try your best to prevent uh, wildlife vehicle collisions by slowing down when you see an animal on along the side of the road. Uh, some animals, this applies more to mammals, I think, uh, they'll just be at the side of the road, but when a car goes by, they might get panicked and they may run across. Or if they are going already across the road, they may get confused as to which way to run. Uh, so this happens, so always slow down. And if you are in a wildlife vehicle collision, please stop a vehicle and inform the authorities but only when it's safe for you to do so. Like, don't just jam break middle of the road, right? And create more uh, issues for yourself and for other road users. And like I said before, if you come across the victims, report them to NPARCs and submit the data to relevant groups. So obviously for the herptile groups, you can, uh, herptile victims, reptiles amphibians, you can submit them to us. But I think there's also the vertebrate study group for other vertebrates. And I think uh, there's also a pangolin group. So there are different groups out there. They actually collect data. Uh, so feel free to check out the groups and then submit it to them. And if it's alive and injured, inform and box or acres so it can be rescued, it can be helped, and it can be rehabilitated back out. Okay, and always be a responsible vehicle user, no matter what vehicle you're on and no matter on what kind of road you're on. Uh, next slide, please. And here are some do's and don'ts uh, as well. Uh, should you see a reptile in nature? Th this doesn't apply just to like roadkill stuff, but like reptiles in nature, right? Remain calm, don't panic, and like do not provoke and attack the animal. Some people be like, interested, like, oh my god, I've never seen a snake before. And then you get too close to it. And then there's always like a safety zone, which you want to stay out of so that uh, the animal doesn't feel defensive and uh, try to run away or something. And if the animal does feel cornered, if let's say you have suddenly moved too close to the animal, feel cornered, back away and allow the animal to escape by itself or move away by itself. And uh, feel free to take plenty of pictures, but don't get too close. Use a zoom function, it is a lot safer. And um, oh, I've already mentioned uh, calling and parks and acres for animals for which are injured and stuff, right? And here are the contact numbers for the and parks animal response center and the acres wildlife rescue hotline. Uh, should you see an animal that is injured, trapped, or otherwise needs help or assistance, right? Uh, next slide, please. Oh, okay. Oh, that's the end of the my talk. I think I'll hand it back to uh, Chanel now. Thank you, Kanan, and to all our speakers for sharing about the, the reptiles that we commonly encounter in Singapore and how we can work towards human wildlife coexistence in our city in nature. So now it's time for our Q&A session. Thank you to everyone in the audience who have submitted their questions. We'll try to answer as many as we can during the session. Okay, so the first one that we have is... Okay. Are the reptiles in Singapore thriving? Shall we have Sanka uh, from the Herpetological Society of Singapore to take this question? Sure. Hi, Chanel. Uh, and hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, are the reptiles in Singapore thriving? That's a very good uh, question. It's also a very broad question. Um, yeah, some reptiles, uh, they've been able to adapt to Singapore's urbanizing environment, right? Uh, like pythons. Uh, um, uh, paradise tree snakes and some bronze bags, these are able to survive in an urban habitat. Uh, but many of them have also, many of our reptile species in Singapore have also been lost because of habitat loss. Over the years, since 1819, as we industrialize, as we urbanize, uh, many of our habitats have been lost and the species that live in them have also gone uh, locally extinct, for example. But that doesn't mean we should not protect what we still have. Uh, many parts of Singapore are being surveyed. Uh, we're, we're constantly uh, finding new things in Singapore. Uh, just last year, uh, they found a new record of the Selango mud snake. Um, or was it this year? Might have been this year. The Selango mud snake, which is a species of snake that hasn't been seen in Singapore in over 100 years. So there are reptiles that you know we didn't know existed in Singapore, uh, and we are constantly finding them in our green spaces. So that makes it all the more important to protect what we have right now. So these spaces could be home for species that we haven't even discovered yet. 
Thank you, Sanka. Okay, the next question we have, are cobras native to Singapore? I think Sanka will also be very good to answer this question for us. Yeah, uh, cobras are native to Singapore. So in Singapore, we have the equatorial spitting cobra, which you would have seen on Kanan's slides earlier. And uh, also the king cobra, which you would have seen on Dr. Abraham's slides earlier. So uh, the king cobra, interestingly enough, is not a real cobra. It's not a true cobra. King cobras exist in their own group called Ophiophagus, right? So Ophiophagus, if you translate it, actually just means snake eater, right? So king cobras are a group of snakes that actually eat other snakes. And you would have seen that in Dr. Abraham's slides as well. We have a king cobra eating a python. Uh, so yes, these are native to Singapore. And uh, it's always very cool to come across a, a cobra, whether it's a spitting cobra or a king cobra. Thanks again, Sanka. All right, well, the next one we have is where is a good place in Singapore to spot snakes safely apart from the zoo? Let's have both Kanan and Dr. Abraham to answer this question. Kanan. Okay, okay thanks, Chanel. This is a great question because now with a lot of like green spaces popping up around Singapore, right? Especially park connectors as well, connecting green spaces. Uh, spotting snakes is actually can be a lot closer to home than you think. Uh, one of my personal places, my personal favorite places to go to is the uh, Pasir, Pasir Ris mangroves. Uh, they are pretty good for snakes and uh, especially for shore pit vipers and a lot of water snakes when the tide's rising and falling, you get different groups of snakes coming out. So that's a good place, uh, at least in the east that I know of. I'm not too sure in the west, unless of course you can go to Sungai Bulo, uh, where like Dr. Abraham mentioned, you can see so many different kinds of reptiles, including uh, saltwater crocodiles which are like the largest species of crocodiles in the world. So yeah, if you want to spot snakes, I think Sungai Bulo and uh, Pasir Ris mangroves are a great place. Uh, Dr. Abram, you want to add on? Yeah, thanks. Besides that, um, the other place that's actually really good to uh, spot snakes in the wild or other reptiles in the wild are actually at our zoo, but not the ones at Reptopia. Uh, they're actually free ranging in the zoo. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure all of you have been to our zoo and, and you see the, the naturalistic setting that the zoo has, has uh, set up there. Uh, and that has been a great enticement for a lot of wild species to reside within the zoo. So if you're, you'll be very fortunate sometimes, just keep a lookout. If you visit the zoo, you're walking around, uh, just keep a lookout at all the shrubs around there and whatnot, you may be fortunate enough to see an oriental whip snake or a paradise tree snake. Uh, you'll see monitor lizards and things like this. And it's, and it's really uh, uh, exciting actually uh, to, to see them outside of the uh, um, enclosure. Having said that, uh, to get to know some of the snakes and how they actually look like uh, in real life, uh, of course, look at the animals in the zoo itself, uh, in Raptopia, and, and you can see them up close very safely. Uh, and and uh, yeah, it just gives you an idea of sometimes how they move, if they're moving at that time and how they look and things like that. Yes. Thanks, Shana. Thank you, Dr. Rehan and Kanan. The fourth question we have is, yeah, quite related. What are some tips for spotting snakes in the wild? Uh, let's have Sanka to share more about this. Spotting snakes in the wild is a pretty challenging thing because snakes are trying to hide from us. So uh, they are making it hard for us to find them. But you can uh, help yourself find these snakes by understanding the snakes a little bit better. So for example, one thing you can do is to understand the uh, habitats and the ecology of these snakes. So for example, if I'm looking for a Wagler's pit viper, I know that Wagler's pit vipers are tree loving snakes. So they love sitting on the low branches of trees and they'll sit at around eye level. So what I can do is look out for their very distinctive coloration at around eye level on the branch. Uh, and, you know, uh, with enough trial and error, you will get the hang of uh, spotting these snakes in the wild. Uh, on top of that, uh, it's also important to uh, observe ethics when you're going out to look for these reptiles, right? Because, um, to find them, you need to go out into green spaces. How can you responsibly use these green spaces? One very important thing uh, is to stay on the trail. Our parks have uh, trails that um, 
many people use. And these trails are areas where animals generally don't, uh, they don't generally sit on the trail too much. So uh, when you go herping, when you go looking for these reptiles, you want to walk along these trails and look on either side. Uh, don't walk off the trail because that's where the animals are, right? And uh, that's where you, you have a higher chance of um, accidentally tra treading on a, on a snake, for example. Another important thing is to observe park opening hours for uh, nature reserves and many of our parks. They are only open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, some, some parks like Pasir Ris Park and uh, Bukit Batok Nature Park, these are open after 7 p.m. as well. Uh, so just check the opening hours of the park that you are visiting at any one time, okay? Thanks again, Sanka. All right, what's next? Okay, why does it seem like there are more snakes now as compared to 10 years ago? Shall we have Serena from Ant Park to answer this question? Hello, okay. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Chanel. So there is a general perception that there are a lot more snakes now as compared to, say, a few years ago. I think we can largely attribute it to the rise of uh, social media sharing. A lot more people, they like to share what they observe, like be of any animals, not just reptiles, on Instagram, on Facebook, on TikTok. And uh, this often goes viral, which gives the impression that, wow, we are having so many snakes. And I think generally we have done well in that we have now a much greater awareness of uh, local native biodiversity, including reptiles. So people are a lot more aware whenever they spot such animals. And uh, lastly, I think because of the pandemic situation, a lot of us here are stuck in Singapore. We aren't able to travel. So this has brought about a, a large crowd going to our nature areas like the nature parks and the nature reserves. And when we have more people coming in, there are more chances for such encounters. Yeah, so it doesn't necessarily mean that there are a lot more snakes now. It's just that people are a lot more aware and we have a lot more records uh, of these encounters. Yeah, back to you, Chanel. Thank you, Serena. All right, the next question. Okay, what are the conservation efforts that have been put in place to protect reptiles? And what, can, what more can be done on an organizational level? Let's have Dr. Benjamin from N Parks as well as Charlene to share more about our local and regional efforts. Dr. Benjamin, yes, to you. Oh yes. Okay. Um, quite a lot. Quite a bit has actually been done to protect and uh, conserve our reptiles. Um, not just by N Parks, but also uh, our other partners like um, HSS, uh, the Herpetological Society, uh, Nature Society, and also the PRS. Um, so like many other native animals, they are protected under the Wildlife Act. So one cannot kill, trap, take, feed, or even release reptiles into the environment. The second thing is actually um, habitat protection. Um, so providing more habitat for our reptiles, um, not just our nature reserves, but also enlarging them by adding nature park networks. Uh, in some of our nature reserves, you may have noticed that there are core conservation areas set aside for um, research and wildlife. Um, and and Sungai Bulo is a good example. I mean, um, Sungai Bulo is a place where you can find uh, three of our superlative reptiles, um, the world's longest, the world's longest venomous snake, and also the world's heaviest reptile. Um, that is the python, the king cobra, and the uh, crocodile, respectively. So, um, and thirdly, I think uh, we have also done quite a bit on... Um, research. Uh, for example, Abraham, Dr. Abraham was mentioning about uh, microchipping the uh, reticulated python uh, so that we can identify them once they're caught again. Um, it gives us a, some insight into their movement ecology, uh, although in a very passive manner, uh, because uh, we would know where we have caught it before and where we found it later. Um, and, and I'm also surprised that, you know, um, I'm, I'm learning more about our native reptiles, such as a clouded monitor uh, in a recent study in the Botanic Gardens uh, to understand several aspects of the ecology. And um, fourthly, I think there's quite a bit of our collaboration with members of the reptile working group um, and also educating wildlife management contractors to ensure best practices uh, in safety and animal welfare uh, when relocating reptiles found in homes and very urban areas. And, and lastly, actually, it's the uh, super outreach uh, done by uh, my colleagues and our other partners and volunteers um, on, on our reptiles and other biodiversity. 
So um, getting to know our snakes and other reptiles uh, and sharing your knowledge uh, with others would help in their conservation too. Uh, in fact, uh, there is the Festival of Biodiversity happening this weekend at the Botany Centre of the Singapore Botanic Gardens uh, with a mix of online and on-site activities. Uh, but please be safe, uh, don't rush down all at once and uh, you can view some of these activities online, right? Thanks. Charlene? Great, thanks, Ben. All excellent um, points, and we definitely all agree with them. Um, some of the other conservation efforts, um, uh, you know, refer to things that, for example, uh, zoological institutions contribute to, um, such as WRS. So, for example, in WRS, we actually have the uh, the only assurance colony of the Roti Island snake neck turtle, which is a critically endangered species uh, from Indonesia. So we're the, uh, the only organization here in, in Southeast Asia um, that has this assurance colony outside of its range uh, area. And in fact, we've working together with uh, multiple partners, including international organizations like WCS. And we have just repatriated, uh, as in sent back, um, the first group of turtles back to their, their home country. Um, you know, certainly also other conservation breeding efforts of other species are also really important. Um, and uh, there are a number of, of many different efforts that have been put in place to protect uh, reptiles, uh, not just in Singapore, but also uh, regionally and internationally. Okay. Back to you, Chanel. Thank you, Dr. Charlene and Dr. Benjamin. The seventh question, yeah, are there measures to control non-native reptiles? I think Dr. Ben, would you like to take this question? Uh, yes, uh, they are. Um, so um, whenever uh, somebody sees a non-native reptile, they're flagged, um, they're monitored, uh, and they're removed from the environment. So uh, we've actually removed uh, green iguanas uh, in the Central Catchment Nature Reserve, uh, and also uh, frequent removal of uh, radius sliders from SBG. Uh, but please, we also appeal to the public um, not to release their turtles uh, in, into our environment. Um, and uh, there have actually been very few studies locally uh, on non-native reptiles, uh, and I think more in-depth reptiles are need. Uh, sorry, more in-depth studies are needed to develop a better understanding uh, of the ecology of non-native species and uh, what may influence uh, whether they're invasive, uh, their ecology, and also their impacts on um, our native fauna. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Benjamin. Okay, next question. How can we better support wildlife conservation on an individual level, apart from monetary donations? Let's have Stanka to answer this question. Sure. Uh, well, monetary donations help. Uh, but uh, on an individual level, it's always good to be informed. So actually, by virtue of the fact that you are all here, because you are all coming to this talk, uh, this webinar to understand more you are in a sense you are helping already because you are educating yourselves and you're learning more uh, but to take this a step further what you can do is to share this newfound knowledge with people within your circles of influence so share with your friends share with your family share with your colleagues if you have a family member who is for example considering buying a red yet slider as a pet Maybe you can talk to them about uh, responsible pet ownership and and what it means to have that pet for life Right? and to not abandon that pet when it gets too old or too big and scary or whatever. So uh, there are many things that we can do within our individual circles. Uh, on top of that, we can go for, we can explore nature in Singapore responsibly, right? So you can join uh, the HSS, for example. HSS, for example, we hold a lot of these uh, walks uh, around Singapore. Uh, of course, given the current restrictions, we've had to put that on a pause. But once we are opened up again, uh, please do join us for uh, our free public guided walks around the green spaces in Singapore. So we've gone to places like Treetop Walk in Macritchie, um, Sungai Buloh Wetland Reserves, and we show people the reptiles and amphibians of our green spaces and how to respectfully coexist with them. So these are all ways in which you can uh, contribute on an individual level. Um, you can also volunteer with many organizations that um, do require help. Uh, and these are all ways in which you can make a difference. Thanks, Sanka. Okay, I think we have a couple more questions remaining. 
Okay, how do we look out for reptiles in our in our environment and when should we stay away? Let's have Nicholas on M Parks to take this question. Thanks, Chanel. Yeah, uh, this seems to be kind of similar to the earlier question to Sanka, but uh, from a different perspective, because you don't want to be close to the reptiles, right? So uh, just, the first, uh, just a few tips. The first thing is when you are uh, in these nature areas, you should be aware that you may uh, be in the presence of these, uh, you actually are in the presence of these reptiles, in fact. So yeah, just keep a lookout for them. Just be a bit more aware when you're walking those areas. Uh, Sankar mentioned earlier as well, just keep to the trails, don't go off trail. Generally, the, uh, these reptiles don't go onto the trails and chill there. So just uh, stay on the trails, uh, don't go into the off trail side because that's where you may end up seeing them a lot more, even stepping on them possibly. Uh, when you, if you do see them, just observe them from a safe distance. Uh, take uh, from, your, from your own homes, right? Uh, you can take certain appropriate measures to uh, prevent the uh, reptiles from entering, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, and yeah, just a final note, maybe I'll sound like a naggy parent, but you know, when you're walking on the trails, don't you know, keep your eyes open, don't you know, be on your phones. That's how you can notice that, yeah, yeah, there are some animals in your midst that you should be looking out for. Yeah, thanks. Back to Chanel. Thank you, Nicholas. Okay, I think we have one more, no, a few more questions. What should I do if I am bitten by a snake? Well, shall we have maybe Dr. Abraham can answer this question too? Sure. So what should you do if you're bitten by a snake? Um, if, now, this is easy to say, not so easy to practice, uh, where you got to stay calm. Um, and what you then do is you call, uh, uh, you call the emergency number. Um, now, what, 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 what do I mean by staying calm? You, you get bitten uh, and you, you don't get all frantic and panicky. And the reason for this is um, you, you want your, your, your you, you don't want to get too excited about it, okay? Uh, because that increases blood flow in your body and things like that. So if you get bitten, let's say from a venomous snake, that's how venom moves quicker in your body. Having said that, if you stay calm, if you uh, just sit down in that given space, call the emergency number, they will come and get you um, and they will know exactly what to do. Now, what you do temporarily, right? You can, you can uh, wash the wound uh, and you can just wash it with water. Um, you can wash it with a disinfectant um, if, if you have one nearby. Uh, or if you have it with you, or just wash it with water. And if you have any kind of a cloth, you can bandage the uh, bitten site, but not tightly. Now, the idea is just to keep that wound uh, uh, protected uh, and uh, to, to uh, uh, sort of immobilize your, your limb if you got bitten by, by on, your, on your ankle, you got bitten on your hand. You don't want too much movement of that hand. Don't, uh, if you don't uh, have a bandage, don't worry about it. Just leave it as it is. And uh, the paramedics that then come to see you, they will know exactly what to do. They will, now for every snake bite, whether it is a venomous, from a venomous species or a non-venomous uh, snake, uh, please still go and see a medical personnel. Uh, because uh, sometimes, um, uh, even though it's non-venomous, Sometimes when a snake bites you and it's biting you because of offense or defense in this sense, uh, some of their teeth sometimes get embedded in your skin. And then, you know, only by going to a medical personnel, they will be able to remove this. Now, do you have to worry about snake bites getting infected? Uh, no, snake bites don't normally get infected at all. Having said that, you still have to keep the wound clean and you must go and see a medical personnel. Uh, I hope I answered the question. Um, can I just add on to that? That's okay. Um, so one thing that many people do is, uh, or, or some people do is actually once they get bitten by the snake, they'll try to capture the snake and bring that to the hospital. Uh, please don't do this. So if you, if by accident, you do get bitten by a snake, uh, you can just take a photo of the snake, leave the snake alone. If the snake goes off, that's fine. Um, if you didn't manage to get a photo of the snake, you can just remember what the snake looked like, right? So 
this information can help medical professionals because um, different kinds of snakes have different kinds of anti-venom. So um, understanding what snake bit you will be very important. All right, so just uh, take a photo or just remember details about the snake. Don't try and capture the snake um, and don't try to suck out the venom um, because if you try to suck out the venom, uh, you can end up like, you know, accidentally infecting the bite, bite site. Thank you, Bianca and Dr. Abraham. Uh, we've come to our final question. Okay, so when we see snakes, how do we know when to call NPAP or Acres for help? And when do we leave it alone? Um, let's have Serena from NPAPs as well as Dr. Shelley from WRS to take the final question. Okay, sure. Thank you, Chanel. So uh, we do receive many, many calls about reptiles through our helpline. And actually, most of them can be categorized as uh, sightings. So if you do spot a reptile, be it a snake or a monitor lizard um, up on a tree, on a branch, in the bushes, or let's say on the grass patch, just busking and going about its own thing, you can actually leave them alone. Like, For example, even if they're in the monsoon drains as well, as we have shown earlier, because they are in um, their natural habitat. But however, if let's say these snakes, they come onto a footpath where there's a lot of uh, traffic footfall, or they are on the road and they persist there, they're not like, you know, slittering off that's when you can call either mparks or acres to come in and that's where we will help to relocate this particular individual to a more forested site well um as we uh, built our city in nature and as we restore a lot more green spaces to our urban environment it is inevitable that we will see and encounter more of these reptiles we just need to learn how we can coexist harmoniously and uh, interact responsibly whenever we see them Okay, so um, yeah, Charlene, do you have anything to add on to that? Thanks, Serena. Uh, excellent points. Just also wanted to say that, you know, certainly as our green and other nature um, spaces, uh, you know, expand, uh, this also means that, you know, we have also to be responsible um, with our youth, especially with, uh, um, especially as drivers. Uh, so being, being driving responsibly and mindfully, which means slowing down, making sure that we're looking, you know, scanning the roads and also scanning the, um, the sides of the roads for, for animals. This can actually help to reduce the number of road kills and will also be safer for people. Um, so uh, if you do come across a reptile that is injured or weak, um, so for example, if you've seen, uh, say, a python getting run over um, by a car and it's, uh, you know, not moving very much on the side of the road, or if, say if you're one of the nature trails um, and see if, if you see a snake get run over by say a, a, a cyclist or something like that and the snake is then also looking very weak afterwards definitely please call for help um, call mpups or acres uh, wildlife hotlines thank you thank you charlene and serena all right with that i'd like to thank all of our panelists again for very generous sharing a uh, big thank you to our audience on both Zoom and YouTube for joining us this morning. Uh, stay tuned for our next webinar in October. It will be on our urban birds. So do keep a lookout for the sign-up link on the NPARCS events page. Thanks again to everyone for attending this session. Have a great day ahead and stay safe. Bye.